My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, a podcast where I, your host, try to give you some tips on how you can explain all this weird, wild, crazy conspiracy stuff to the people you love most, because that's what I've been trying to do for the past 10 years with no success. I've been telling everybody that I give them in a shady, but every time I do, my family thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. I'm your host, Mark Palmer, and with me today on the show is a gentleman who is a bona fide alchemist, folks. Not only that, he's living off the grid, he's raising animals, he's raising plants, he's living an Odinist lifestyle. What? What's that? Odinism? Have you heard of it before? I hadn't. Maybe briefly. But yeah. He's a really interesting guy. His name is Benjamin Balderson. He's got a show called Odin's Alchemy on Rockfin and YouTube. Check him out. He's a really wise guy, and we got into some really wise stuff. We talked about the heathen cosmology. We talked about the sacred origins of cannabis and how it fits in so perfectly with the alchemical process. It's amazing. And, yeah... Not only did we mention cannabis as a form of uh, alchemical processing, or at least a a candidate for it, we talked about alchemy as it pertains to you, your life, your soul. Benjamin, like I said, really wise dude. Show him some love, and thank you for listening to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy. This is the year anniversary of the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. October 5th was when the first episode came out, so... If you haven't heard all the episodes, be sure to check them all out. We've got almost 87. I think this is going to be 87, episode 86 or 87. So we're going strong one year in, baby. And for this week, since it's our year anniversary, I'm going to put out four shows in one week. That's right. You've seen me put out two before. You've seen me put out three. Sometimes I even only put out one a week. But this time, since it's the one-year anniversary, we're putting out four episodes. That's right. Enjoy. Have a great day wherever you are in the now. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. I hope you enjoy this episode. They don't go back to Kanunga Gap. They don't even recognize that because they're a much newer culture. In fact, they even state that our culture was already here. They just don't consider us humans. And so we were already here hanging out, doing our thing, developing things, looking at nature and garnering understandings from it. And they just didn't arrive on the scene till later. And you start looking at other things like in the situation where I just described with the electrical universe, the, the sun is fem, is feminine and the moon is masculine. And you look at all these older cultures and the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine. But then when you look at the Abrahamic and their cultures, the sun is masculine and the moon is feminine, which is a very odd thing, which I can un- a little bit understand because the sun does the projecting at the end but that's a lack of understanding through the entire cycle so understanding that the moon did the projecting first and that's like calling the chicken the masculine one because the chicken pops out the egg but the the rooster had to fertilize the chicken and then the chicken now produces the fertilized egg so it's a lack of understanding of the process 
So what happens is the Gananga Gap pulls Muspelheim and Niflheim together, or the ice world and the fire world, and it pulls these two together. And when this happens, the ice world, which is perfectly stable, meets the perfect chaos of the fire world. And in between, as these two are meeting, is where you find life in the Vesca Pisces of these two things. And this is where life finally starts happening. Now, this is part of also why in most cosmologies, the feminine side has two names where she's the creator and the destroyer. And the masculine side, they each only have one name because the masculine side split into the fire and the ice where the feminine side is whole. And she is doing two actions. She's the one who caused Ragnarok. She's also the one who caused the original life and causes the new life. Welcome to the show, man. So for folks who have never heard about you before, tell us a little bit about how you got into all this stuff and and who you are, where you come from. Well, hey, Mark, it's it's an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. So I I live in off farm. I live self-sufficient, completely off grid. I have a small farm. It's uh, I raise alpacas and I have four milk cows while well, one of them's a bull and uh i have alpacas and some milk goats and a whole lot of birds and part of that is is that i'm an odinist it's real important for an odinist to live on at least on a small farm and be self-sufficient it's it's one of the hinge points of our of our culture and then also in my uh, time i have a, a lab so i uh, developed uh what's called Wilson's disease. It's a real rare disease that's just genetic and it ends up where I overload on copper and I have grand mal seizures. So I started doing, making my own medicine because the uh, medicine that they were giving me just made me sick and it really turned me into a zombie. I instead started uh, making my own medicine and I've always, since I was young, read a lot of different theologies, different cosmologies. I've went to just about every religious ceremony I've ever been offered, be it Native American to Jewish to uh, Muslim, uh, Christian, you name it. I've been to all of them and experienced and looked at all of their things. So as I'm looking at some of the occult things and different old works and then I'm making my different medicines. I'm noticing how often that the things that I'm doing are matching up with what they're talking about. And I ended up taking an interest in spagyrics and spagyrics being the first start of alchemy where you're taking and you're breaking down plant material and then performing the great work on it in order to achieve the most medicinal use out of the plant material. And I started doing that. And then as you're reading things, they just start clicking and it's no different than if you're working in grandpa's garage, working with grandpa, and then you go to school and you start reading at tech school, start reading the manuals and all you understand what you do, what they're talking about because you've been doing that with grandpa. So these occult books really started snapping into place and uh, from there I just kind of took off I started just working on alchemy and doing all kinds of experiments and building my lab up and now I've got a pretty uh pretty fancy lab it's pretty nice and I pretty much do that kind of thing all the time outside of just whatever it takes to do my farm wow so all right you're bringing up a lot I love I love how you mentioned, you know, a main tenant, if you will, I know you didn't use that word, of Odinism is to have land and be on a farm. I myself, 
during the pandemic last summer, I, ha I had a job milking cows on a farm. And every week I would drive out, you know, kind of into a rural area in my state and milk cows with a friend. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't really get paid much other than like <laughs> some milk and, and like the learning. But but yeah, it was really relieving and relaxing. And I felt like I connected with the creator there. So I totally, you know, I want to dive deeper f into that myself, you know, as my life progresses. But alchemy, another thing that's come up for me, I mean, I've been looking into the history of the state I'm in, Connecticut, and I found out that the first governor of the Connecticut colony was an alchemist by the name of John Winthrop Jr. He was the son of one of the first founders of the colony of Massachusetts. And he came down and, you know, helped found the Connecticut colony and legitimized the settlements that were in here under the eyes of the, the king, right? And he was one of the first members of the Royal Society. So, you know, that's as much as I've oh, gone wow. into, into my local searches other than, you know, he, he set up a couple iron works and they saw the soil in, in Saybrook, Connecticut and saw like this mica in the soil and thought, well, oh, maybe there's silver around here somewhere. So they settled in, in Saybrook and I don't think they found much silver. If they did, they definitely didn't talk about it but much, but ivory came in through that place a lot much later on. Either way, side notes, alchemy, huge fascination. And you're somebody who's practicing alchemy i mean for those who who maybe still have this kind of mainstream impression of alchemy can you you know elaborate a little bit on spagyrics and and how you know because i think a lot of people understand the metaphor of lead to gold right and the truth is there are people who have done alchemical processes to actually do that. Like it's a physical thing that people have done. At least that's what I've read and found in my research. But, you know, there's also the layer that it's a metaphor for the soul and, you know, transmuting your, your lead soul to gold, you know. But I feel, I feel like when you take it into the realm of the plant kingdom... In spagyrics, alchemy becomes something completely different. It's like it's like the secret side of it they, that they've been hiding from us. Do you feel the same way? Well, the the lead to gold also. So yeah, we're gonna have to put that one back on the back burner for a minute. Um, <laughs> that one's such a, agreed completely that metaphorically that is it's beautiful and understanding that, but there's. There's so much more to that. We'll put that on the back burner for a moment. So spagyrics is, is absolutely amazing. And, and what you do with spagyrics, one of the best parts about it is, is plants are fairly easy to understand. And once you get a real firm grasp of what's going on with spagyrics, then you use the rule of correspondence. And the rule of correspondence is, is as above, so below, as most people know it. So what happens and the way things work in the plant kingdom, they also work in every other level. So the animal kingdom that's going to work the same and the mineral kingdom, it's going to work the same. And you, you gain this understanding through that. <clears throat> now, what an alchemist really does is, is break things down to their finest components and then take out what they want or don't want and then put, back, put it back together in an alchemical marriage. So you start out with, and, and the plant that I like to use the most because so many people are familiar with so many of the terms that I'm getting ready to use when it applies to that is cannabis. So you start out with a whole cannabis plant and this plant is a beautiful plant and you look at it and you take it in for all, for its, for its entirety. And then you understand that as an alchemist, now I'm going to take, and I'm going to break this plant down. And so you take and you macerate it, you break it down. And what you're going to do is you're either, you're going to do some form of either uh, steam distillation you're going to soak it in alcohol, something that's going to strip away the oil from the plant material. So you end up with two different sides is an oil side and a plant material side. 
And one side is going to be your feminine and the plant material side is going to be your masculine. After you've done this separation, and we're going to say that you did it with alcohol, which is because because that's what most people are going to do. You're going to take the plant material, which is now just dead material now that you've stripped the oil out of it. And you're going to light that on fire, which is going to burn off the residual alcohol. And then you're going to throw it in a crucible and you're going to throw it over some fire and you're just going to sit and you're going to let that burn and you're going to grind it and stir it and grind it and let it just sit there and burn and burn. And this is one of the phases that most people are most familiar with is the blackening or nigrato. So this plant material at first is going to be a vibrant green with cannabis. You get, you know, oranges, purples, all kinds of different colors. Well, the first thing that's going to happen when this thing gets underneath heat is the carbon is going to activate and it's going to get brought to the surface. So, and this applies to all plants and this carbon is something that belongs to the earth level. Now this activated carbon, a lot of people are familiar with it because if you take like the activated carbon out of a hardwood, well, the way they make that is they just take some logs, throw it in a, in a burn barrel and pour, when it gets red hot, you just pour water on it and the little chunks that were glowing red coals are now black little chunks that you grind up and you've got your activated carbon that people are using in toothpaste and soaps and everything else. I use that as a biochar and I make a lot of biochar and use that as a base for my gardening. So this, what you got is this carbon now coming up and coming to the very surface and that's the blackening. And metaphorically, you can take that to understanding that when you're trying to make changes in your life, trying to get the impure things out of yourself and make changes, uh, a lot of times you end up falling back and, uh, those old habits will always come up to the front. You know, you, you think that you would quit doing this thing that, but now all of a sudden you get under too much stress, too much anger, too much hardship. And all of a sudden you're smoking cigarettes again or, or whatever it is that you thought that you had given up and changed. And you really see that in this process because every time that you think that you've gotten the ash down to a nice white, You go and give it a stir and it just turns black again. And you're like, wow, wow. So this pretty much takes all day, but at the end of it, you're going to have, you're going to get it down to a fine white, lightly grayish powder. And you want it to be a real nice, even consistency, real nice and fine. And what you're going to do then is you're going to pour distilled water into it. And you want to use distilled water because If you don't, water in and of itself has salt in it, mineral salts, and you're going to mix, you're going to end up having that mixed in with your experiment, whatever it is that you're making. And you don't want to do that. Where distilled water, all the salts have been stripped out of it. So you're going to use distilled water and you're going to make a nice little soup. And then you're just going to pour that through uh, coffee filters until it's, and keep doing that over and over again. And until it becomes a nice clear water. And then at that point, you're just going to let the water evaporate off and you're going to have a nice little pile of salt left there in the bottom. And that's going to be the actual plant mineral salts. And that's the heart, the actual purity of the body of the plant. Now you're going to switch over to the oil side. And on the oil side, you're going to notice that the oil in and of itself be it with this, with being cannabis, you have three levels of oil and this is going to apply again to everything. And you have three basic levels of salt, which is going to, each level is going to split into four, giving you 12 levels of salt total and 12 levels of oil total. But that's, that's a little bit more complicated than we need to talk about. So you end up with the three levels and with cannabis, it's terpenes, which is your most volatile level. And then it moves up to CBD and then it moves up to THC. And then again, each of those break down into four and we all realize that there's THCA, THCB, so on and so forth. Now on the, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. 
I was going to say on the point of terpenes, you know, something a friend of mine who grows and has some really tall buds growing, I won't disclose his location because it is legal now where I live, but either way, he mentioned last time I was chilling with him, I was like, yeah, did you know that, you know, inside cannabis is like all of the terpenes that, you know, you would see like in fruit, like it's like, it has like all of these terpenes in one. It's so complex. I don't know. Maybe this is diverting and we'll come back to this at some point, but the tree of life is definitely a big, you know, <laughs> hint and we've talked to chris bennett a scholar on cannabis on this show before and you know he's made a lot of connections to cannabis and the tree of life but either way i'm bennett fascinated. is fantastic love him yeah i'm, I'm fascinated we're at, i think we're at the albedo stage right now right with the oil phase coming in and and then the reddening would be the the fourth phase am i jumping ahead too far there or well with the with your with your reddening that still happens in the I, I i left those out i forgot to put those in so when you're when you're getting that plant material heated up and boiled down you're going to actually see where the the reddening and the yellowing is going to happen and the reddening is going to happen first and it's basically this pile of ash is going to start glowing and then it's going to glow a little bit brighter and brighter until it reaches this yellowing. And what's happening is these salt crystals are actually pulling together and become, and crystallizing and <clears throat> separating away from everything else. And at that point, every time you hit this pile, it's just going to do that same thing, which is amazing. Well, now you understand that the feminine side, this is an oil. If I hit this with heat right now, this is going to evaporate, boil off, vaporize, be gone. The salt side is just going to turn this bright yellow glow. And then if I pull the heat away, it's just going to be done. And it's just going to sit there, which is fairly amazing. <clears throat> right. So then we're going to move on to the oil side. And now with the oil side, which again, the terpenes, that is, it is fascinating. And we can get into the tree of life later also. The terpenes, absolutely. Cannabis has such an amazing variety of terpenes. It is absolutely shocking. And the thing about terpenes is, and this is one of the things that is also seminal for being an alchemist, is growing your own herbs and growing or, or go, picking these things wild. Because... In the morning, when the sun very first hits your garden, if you're standing there, you'll notice the most wonderful fragrances all of a sudden just are filling your nose. It's just screaming with them, and they're so delicate and just amazing. And what's going on is that tiny little bit of sunlight is all that it takes to burn off those terpenes. The, the, your oil builds up overnight. And so in the morning when the sun hits that, now that oil immediately starts burning off and the terpene level of the three oils is the most volatile. And each one of these oils is going to have a different reaction to your body. And because it's an oil, it's going to have a more feminine reaction. So it's going to open things up rather than where the salt is the push, the oil is going to open things up more. So when you smell those terpenes, like if you smell food cooking, you walk by anytime you're talking about that smell, that's the terpenes being burnt off. Well, <clears throat> what happens when the terpenes hit your nose, your mouth starts watering, your stomach starts gurgling, you start producing bile, your, your body is getting ready to take in the body of the plant because it just smelled some good smells of the oil. And so you're going to then take and distill out, clean out your three different levels of oil. Now, inside of the oil, the oil in and of itself is basically clear. You know, like if you look at like an olive oil, anything like that, especially if you get it when it's nice and fresh and you've picked it before the sun even hits it and you get it when it's before it's turned, 
you get some real nice, clear, clear oil. Now there's going to be a yellowishness in this oil, especially if it's, if it's uh, fresh and you're going to have your sulfur element inside of there. And that's going to be the life of the plant. <clears throat> and so at this point, now we understand that we've got our three elements that are the purity of the plant that we've gotten down to. We've gotten down to the salt and we've gotten down to the mercury, which is going to be the oil. And then we've gotten down to the sulfur, which is going to ride inside of this oil. Now, mercury is going to be one of the, is one of the most misunderstood things that you ever hear somebody talk about, especially in the occult circles. Now, when you look at mercury, what mercury's job is, is to make the transition between these two things. So it, one of a good example of mercury is, is water and that's your earth level of mercury. And if you take water and you take like Kool-Aid, you can now take and pour some Kool-Aid into the water. And now this whole thing is just cool is just Kool-Aid because this water amalgamated this uh, Kool-Aid powder. Well, mercury is going to do the same thing on the metallic level. And this is where philosophically, we call this mercury. Mercury actually can grab onto gold and most metals. There's a few odd, odd ones that it doesn't react with that for good reasons, um, like iron. But mercury gra is grabs onto gold and will actually amalgamate it and open that up. So what's going on when you're talking about the plant oil is this is the mercury of the plant. And this oil is actually going to open up this salt because if you look at the salt, the hard crystal, that's not open to, to being bioavailable nor to receiving anything. Where now if we mix this in with the liquid, we can now look at like a Masuru Emoto's work where, where you get uh, cymatics out of these things and you can start seeing what's going on. And this can actually start catching signals also. You know, you can yell at water and actually see where the water picks up and grabs onto that vibration and receives it. And this, and now this is able to go pass back and forth into this salt. Now, what you're actually trying to as an alchemist then is, is through this mercury, you need this sulfur to go down into the salt and marry into the salt and enliven it. And then the whole thing is going to coagulate into the stone of whatever plant, in this particular case, cannabis. So you end up with a stone of cannabis. You take, at the end of this, you take your plant oils, your plant, your mercury, and you put it in a flask with your salt. And you're going to have to find the levels. Make sure you have the, because it's going to be a real nice proper even mix. If you have too much, too much of the mercury, it's going to be liquidy and it won't solidify together too much of the salt and you know you'll see that grain that graininess in the bottom where it gets precipitate you don't want either thing so it's one of those things that you learn to have a balance and then at that point you throw some heat to it and the two things will end up alchemically marrying wow. and locked together yeah now, the interesting thing about the locked together piece is before where we were talking about where if you put fire to the feminine side, it will vaporize and leave. And if you and uh, if you put it to the masculine side, it won't do anything. And the feminine side normally is oily and loose and the masculine side is hard and crystal. Well, now that they're merged, uh, it's called the stone because it's in a hard, basically stone like consistency to begin with and then if you throw heat to it it will actually melt and end up vaporizing like the feminine inside wow so and this is this is exactly i mean when you brought up terpenes and then you get to this conclusion i mean it's reminding me of like my, what my friend told me he's like hey give the plant a little touch and then you know walk over here and then we walked away and i smell my fingers like two you know minutes later and it's like whoa this huge potent whiff of of terpenes and it's just like you know and then i was reminded i'm like oh this is just like that concentrate that 
a guest sent me a couple months ago. It smells just like it, you know, it's super potent. But yeah, man, I'm I'm fascinated. When you bring up the alchemical wedding, you know, all of this information really I've heard it through a couple different lenses and it becomes a little confusing, you know, it's almost like you know, what is this stuff really about? Because I've heard, you know, the Ro- Rosicrucian angle, and I don't know how much I trust them, you know, <laughs> given some right. what some people are saying about the Rosicrucians. But I'm curious, you know, given your background with alchemy, is this, you know, your own way of, like, fusing the two, or is there something about alchemy that's inherent to Odinism? So th- this is, honestly, I'm not a traditionally trained alchemist. And that's an absolute fact. And so a lot of times my terminology isn't exactly uh, what other people use either. And I would say, and there's, there's another interesting thing. And it's a a conversation I even had today with another fella just talking. So the way people look at Odinists and as heathens, they look at us as this barbaric raping, pillaging, drunk society. And that's, that's, it couldn't be further from the truth. And that's absolute insanity. And the proof is all there to be found. Uh, all over the world, you see rune stones, uh, different artifacts that have been left by heathen traders where they've visited all these different lands and, and you know, had active trading with these people. Now, people understand that that happened long before most of the other cultures had access to sea travel. The most people understand that the heathens were the first known deep sea, deep seafarers and they would go long distances. That means that they had to understand astronomy. They had to understand map making their ships were superior to everybody else's ships. They were the best ship builders. They had, they had to understand the currents and how to mark and recreate all of that. This is not a, a low class society of ignorant people. That that's just insanity. So I do believe without a doubt that Odin performed alchemy and this was something that he was very aware of. Odin in his own words says that only a wise man would go out to other cultures and learn from other people you know, as opposed to somebody that just sits in their home and thinks they're wise. And that was something that he gave his entire life to wisdom and knowledge. So the idea that he wouldn't use these and spagyrics is just basic plant medicine. At the end of the day, what, what you've done is you've taken a plant that was not potato, only had a certain effectiveness and it, you've multiplied that many times over. So you've taken something like you talked about the the concentrate of cannabis that you had received and you take like a little dab. And there's part of the reason that people call it dabs because just a tiny little bit will just completely tear somebody's face off as opposed to sitting down and smoking uh, a whole bunch of flour, you know, bong loads after bong loads and, this tiny little pinhead just did more than you've ever had. So you're talking about just spiking the efficacy. And part of that is, is these earth earth things that were in between the things that we burnt out on the process, the water, the carbon and the cellular material. These were basically, if we look at this electrically, these were ohms. And what's going on is, is the, the sulfur side and the crystal side, they're opposing forces that are actually the same thing. But in order to hold them together because they're oppositional while they're experiencing duality, the carbon, water, and cellular material bind them together. And that's basically what we would call dirty mercury. And so we're going to burn that out and we're going to put the whole system back together again and take away the ohms. And now when we bind them back together again, they're going to be aligned together properly. And they're going to be one thing again, where before we had three pieces. Now as one piece after the alchemical marriage, we can't separate these three, these three things anymore. They're, they're bound, they're bound permanently. Now this is now just cannabis. 
before we had salt of cannabis, we had the, the oil, we had the sulfur, and now we just got this cannabis. This is all that there is. <clears throat> so we've now aligned these two ends and we've basically taken this thing from being a conductor to being a superconductor where there's now no ohms in it whatsoever. So the transmission is perfect. You don't have that loss. Now, break down ohms for me because I'm following you up until you use that word. Maybe I missed something, but can you break down for people like me who, who didn't catch that ohms? So ohms, in your typical electrical setup, what happens is, is I have this electrical wire. And if I take an electron and I put it in this side of the wire, it bumps all the other little electrons through the wire, bump, 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 and then tell another one at the other very end falls out. And that one's now usable to the TV or whatever I have plugged in. Now, during this entire process, you lose power through transference, through heat, you're going to lose some of this. And what's that? We're going to, that's going to be called ohms. It's literally going to stop your power from, from flowing through correctly. It, you know, you've got too many of these little electrons, you know, some of them get bound up here and there. You've not, it's basically like a traffic jam. Now, when you aligned everything perfectly, what you end up with is what you would call a superconductor. And with a superconductor, rather than an electron entering this side and it bumping all the other little electrons in a line and then one falling out, with a superconductor, all the molecules are perfectly aligned. And so something exists on side A, it also exists on side B at the same time. Right. Okay. Definitely. There is no... Definitely no having loss. flashbacks to science class in, in middle school. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. I feel a little dumber, but smarter at the same time because you said that very well-spoken explanation of ohms. But yes, okay, I'm sorry to derail things because now I, I follow you a little bit better. But maybe that doesn't derail things because I'm wondering, you know, no. given, given all you know, obviously plant medicine, very important and given what we planned on talking about this Odinism and alchemy, how that fits in, you know, what is an Odinist, you know, not a modern Odinist per se, but maybe like historically, how do Odinists or Odinism, what's their view of electrons and the world around us? Cause I know some ancient cultures do have pretty profound explanations for our reality that, you know, people usually dismiss and say like, Oh, well they were just using metaphors or that's, you know, nonsense from some, you know, what, whatever you have it. And I'm curious to know like where the, electric universe model maybe fits in because that's something i've learned a lot about recently fantastic so i have a, a universe model that i've been working on that i also use uh different old cosmologies including my own including ownness to gaining understanding of and it's not exactly the electric universe, but it's, it is an electrical universe. It's a biochemical electrical universe is what you end up with <clears throat> in this universe. And this also matches alchemically. So, and this is one of the things that I, that I find and I, and I work on hard. If, if you're talking about something in nature, if it matches on all levels, now, now you're getting somewhere alchemically, when you look at the different luminaries, which you have your, your basic ones, your five planets and your, your known planets that they had, and then your sun and moon, these are all alchemically tied to a metal. Because when you look at the sun or you look at the moon, this actually is that metal sped up. And you can slow that down. And this is no different than if you take a light bulb and you take a filament and run electricity through it, what's happening is that the metal of that filament is getting sped up to the point where it 
produces light. And now that it's producing light, that travels. So that's just a tiny little burn off of that metal, is that light that's being produced. And you can see that over time, that filament will get slightly thinner. And so this metal, the sun and the different luminaries, as it passes through the atmosphere, it gets, it gets uh, condensed and more and more dense. And then inside the earth ends up becoming piles of metal. Now, alchemically, the sun is gold. So the moon is silver. Mars is iron. Venus is Jupiter is tin. Uranus is aluminum. And Saturn is lead. Now, what you have here is, is a basic galvanic battery. Now, the way a galvanic battery works is you have an anode and a cathode. The anode is going to be your negative, and then the cathode is going to be your positive. You're going to have an uh, electrolytic solution or a mercury solution that is going to carry the charge and a salt bridge. <clears throat> now, the anode needs to be more unstable than the cathode because the anode needs to degrade. So that way, as the anode is degrading, it oxidizes. And anytime you oxidize, it releases electrons. And so what's going to happen is, is the moon, as a silver, is going to oxidize and it's going to release electrons. Those electrons are going to go over and impregnate the sun. Now we have a slight charge change and the actual body or the mass or the ions of the anode are going to go over and go over to the cathode while they had this gestation period. Now <clears throat> this is an actual loss of mass in the anode. So this silver's actually become less and the gold cathode has become more but after this gestation period now the cathode will hold on to the ions and release these extra electrons so these extra electrons are now available for use and that's going to be projected out to the world which is going to be your morning sun or your spring sun you're at the beginning of the month after the lunar cycle sun, you know, because everything works. The cycles are all the same as above, so below. So your days and your months and your years, everything's going to work in basically the same. So the other planets or the other luminaries are then in order of degradation, just going to pass from one to another. So at the end of this, the, the lead of Jupiter is going to end up passing electrons and ions over to the, or the lead of Saturn over to uh, the tin of Jupiter or over to the aluminum of Uranus, so on and so forth until it reaches silver. And this is why alchemically everything becomes silver and then becomes gold. So everything's going to pass along. And what we're looking at is orders of, of, of stability. Now, as these completely deteriorate, then the sun itself, which is the gold, ends up becoming bigger and bigger because everything is actually from the sun or derived from gold. All these other metals are derived from gold. And so as this whole system sucks back in on itself and we see the contraction of the universe because we're already living in the active battery. And during this contraction, the universe is sucking back in on itself and it's all returning back to the sun. Now, in every cosmology then, there is typically, like in mine, we call it Ragnarok. Again, with this battery, now the funny thing about these galvanic battery is, is as this happens... If I go to recharge the battery or throw a hard charge into that cathode, that cathode will start breaking apart and through electrolysis. 
And then that will flow back and the gold will literally refill back into the anode and so on and so forth. And what we see is the creation of the universe as the gold breaks apart through electrolysis and becomes all of these lesser metals. And in our cosmology, the way that's explained in Ragnarok is in the end times, the batteries basically becoming deplete. So men start losing their minds, doing crazy things, and the earth quits working right. Just like any other battery, when it starts becoming deplete and all of a sudden your electronic devices do weird things and your phone starts acting up real funny and your, your apps don't work and things like that, the, the same thing's going to happen in this, in this battery that we live in. And there's a three-year period where crops won't grow and there's an extended winter and things just quit working right. So all the planets come into alignment and the nine worlds come into alignment. And at that time, the armies of Sirt from Muspelheim, which is the sun, come marching out and destroy everything and burn everything in the nine worlds to ash. He drives his sword through the entire thing and it burns everything to ash. And at the same time, the armies of Jotunheim take a great ship and that ship meets this fire. And what we have is, is, and we'll get into this in just a second, the original creation is what we have is, is the same thing has happened in the original creation and it ends up becoming the recreation. So that destroys everything, but then it also renews everything. And when the water recedes from the ice world and the fire world meeting, when that water that happens because of it recedes, the earth is always abundantly green with plant life and fruits and grains that no hand sowed that just appeared out in the field. And it was no problem. We're talking a garden of Eden type thing again, because the batteries refilled and now everything's lush and green and abundant. Wow. Yeah. I, and, and then as this gets into, you know, <clears throat> The fall, I mean, maybe we're jumping ahead a little bit. You know, you mentioned the, you know, evidence for heathen travelers all over Americas. I mean, we found a lot of evidence for that here in the Northeast. I mean, something that's really important to me is Michael Wan's work on the Susquehanna River and that name of one of the largest rivers in the United States, Susquehanna, has ties to the Gaelic language. It's an Algonquin word, but it, it has Gaelic connections, which I'm sure you know has connections to through the Viking culture to everything you're talking about. So let's go a little, little further there. And absolutely. And there's tribes over there that had members that were redheaded, white skinned members of the tribes. This is it, but everybody's got to act like that's mysterious. Like we don't all know that, you know, that Vikings have been coming here and traveling back and forth for thousands of years before the Christianized world came here. Cause that's, that's what the deal is with that is that we're not, we're not people. We're not humans. You know, when you, when you look at the book of the law or the, the Torah, it, it, it's part of the reason and people get so confused with the old Testament of the Christians of why, when in the garden of Eden, you had Adam and Eve, and then they had two sons, Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel and then leaves the garden of Eden and then comes back with the wife. And that wife didn't just like fall off of a tree. She came from an entire society. Well, how were them not the, also not the first men from before Adam and Eve, since this is an entire society, because these weren't men in their opinion. These are goyims. They don't have a soul. So whenever you're talking about that, America was not found by Christianized people until the time that we're taught. We're heathen people, your original people that followed Odin and things like that, 
your original Vikings, they've been coming over here for thousands of years and actively trading with these people. We just didn't feel the need to conquer them and take their stuff. Right on. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. that, And that's why there is all this like sort of, mysticism i think around it because or not mysticism but mystery or shrouded history and you know things being concealed because yeah there's this sort of reality shift that has been facilitated by the abrahamic religions in a lot of ways you know judaism christianity and even here in the united states stamping out so-called witches you know up here in new england that's something that people know a lot about but more importantly there's so many connections to northern europe in northeastern united states it's amazing yeah i really i'm fascinated to to go more but i don't want to stray too far from the ancient stuff if if there's anything we need to elaborate on no, I, I uh, definitely. Uh, so I said we were going to get into the original creation story, which that kind of ties that all together. So then in your original creation story, what you have is you have an ice world and a fire world. And this is the masculine side of things. And then also you have Gedunga Gap, which is the yawning chasm or the void. And this is the feminine side. And when you have at this setup point, we don't even have life yet. So what happens is the Gananga gap pulls Muspelheim and Niflheim together or the ice world and the fire world. And it pulls these two together. And when this happens, the ice world, which is perfectly stable meets the perfect chaos of the fire world. And in between, as these two are meeting, is where you find life in the Vesca Pisces of these two things. And this is where life finally starts happening. Now, this is part of also why in most cosmologies, the feminine side has two names, where she's the creator and the destroyer, and the masculine side they each only have one name because the masculine side split into the fire and the ice where the feminine side is whole. And she is doing two actions. She's the one who caused Ragnarok. She's also the one who caused the original life and causes the new life, even though she's not part of this world. And this is part of why most cosmologies are masculine because we live in the material side. We don't live in the immaterial. The immaterial is mysterious to us. It's the cause of our life. It's the cause of of everything here, but it's not really part of this. So we only have a real understanding of the masculine side as opposed to the feminine side. Now, when these two worlds meet, then you have your first beings. So your first being is Ymir. And Ymir's this great ice giant. And this ice giant is frozen in the ice. And then you have Adumbla. And Adumbla is the great cow. And she's feminine. And Adumbla is going to lick at the ice, freeing Ymir. And then also she's going to free Buri as she keeps licking at this salty ice, this rimy ice. And this is going to free the first god and the first giant. Now, when you look at a Dumbla, what you can liken that to is the horns uh, is Hathor and the horns of Hathor. So what do we have here but the sun beating down on the ice and freeing up the things inside as the life starts to appear? Now, from the fecund areas of Ymir, this is where these other live, lively things start appearing, including Buri. Who's, the fir- who's considered the first god. Now, Buri ends up having Bor, who marries Besla, and Buri, Bor, and Be- or, uh, Bor and Besla have Odin, Vili, and Ve, the three, bu- the three brothers. Now, <clears throat> Odin, Vili, and Ve, at that point, then go 
in Slay, Lim, Slay Ymir. And with Ymir's body parts, his skull, they make the firmament. With his bones, they make the mountains and the lands. And with his blood makes the oceans. And also part of that is rivers that come from the teats of Adumbla as she's wick- licking away at the ice. And so they use the parts of Ymir to create this world. Now, interesting enough, basically, Burry and them just disappear from the story. And the Lord of the Rings is entirely based off of heathen cosmology. And uh, recently, in- I recently heard that Tolkien was, you know, a student, you know, and read all these Finnish and Scandinavian texts. I think it was Oxford where he was educated. Yes. So, yeah, that's fascinating that you're bringing that up because I just recently heard about that, I think, on the Mysterious Universe podcast. But please go on. Nice. So you look at one of the characters that he has in the Cimmerillion and stuff is uh, Tom, Bom- uh, Tom Bombadil. And he's this creature, he's this being that is from before the creation of the world and isn't really subject to it, just kind of like hanging out, doing whatever he feels like, right? And so my opinion is this is Burry, you know, this god that didn't get destroyed because when Odin, Billy, and they slay Ymir, that drowns all the giants. The blood, the wash of his blood drowns out all the giants except for two who end up then going and remaking the, the race of giants. But Burry was not part of that. So in my opinion, but then he just kind of disappears from the story. Also, there's a whole lot of uh, things that are missing because they tried real hard to completely wipe out our cosmology and our people. So that's gone. And also a Dumbla just kind of disappears. So like I said, you can take that to the horns of Hathor and she is the sun, but in the storyline, it just kind of disappears. So just a space cow out there floating somewhere with some other guys, hilarious. But, you know, when you start taking and looking at it as a reality and understanding that this was the sun unfreezing the ice side and everything else. So now that we've got, we've actually got a world and what we can take that entire storyline there as was the primordial becoming of this plane, of this world. And now that we've got this world, Odin himself starts moving on and he needs, he has two ravens, Yugen and Munin and Yugen and Munin fly out and travel all across the world. And they bring him back all the knowledge of the world. And Odin understands that this is just not enough. And we can equate this into his third eye being open. He he has this open third eye. And so Odin understands that just the knowledge alone is not enough. He needs to also garner the the wisdom. And in order to get this wisdom, he goes down to Jotunheim to his uncle and goes and sees his uncle Mimir. And Mimir guards well. And so we start understanding that when we looked at the ravens where we get the high mind, the third eye, this is upper And now for the wisdom, we need to get down into that salt mine where the wisdom's going to lie. And he asked Mimir for a drink from his well. And Mimir says that he can have a drink, but it'll cost an eye. So Odin takes his eye and he throws it down the well. Now, in the story where we were just talking about alchemy, we understand that that highest oil or the THC, its job was to open up the lowest salt. So when he took this third eye, this highest oil, and he throws it down the well and opens up this lowest salt and opens up his ancestral wisdom. Wow. Now, right, right. But <laughs> yeah. we're not done. We're not done. So Odin realizes this is still not enough. And so he has to go and hang himself on Yggdrasil. (laughs) Now, when you look at the hangman representation, it's never hung by the neck. 
the hangman is always hung by one ankle and his other leg is crossed over in what looks like an upside down four or the symbol of sulfur. And so what we understand is through this hangman position is like we were talking about in alchemy before, this is the sulfur going, going down and entering into the salt. Right. So the sulfur has got to go down into the salt. So now when we look at what Odin is doing on Yggdrasil is he's going through the alchemical marriage. The sulfur is going down into the salt. And at the end of this process, Odin reaches down and down, not up. He reaches down. So you realize that he's going down into the roots to do this and grabs the, grabs the runes and pulls them to him and throws himself from the tree. Grabs the runes, grabs the, the language in a way. Is that what you're getting at there? Yes. Runes is in our, not, not just, not yes, the R U N E, the runes, like the the alphabet, the language, and when you start understanding the runes, there's so much more than it just being an alphabet. The runes in its in and of itself is a complete understanding of a life cycle of the world. It, it, it's amazing, and Odin ga- gained all that and all the spells that go with it, and he threw himself from Yggdrasil which is Odin completing the alchemical marriage. And so what the saying is, is that he sacrificed himself to himself. Before this, there was Odin, Billy, and Ve. Now, when Odin, Billy, and Ve created man, Odin gave man his high mind. Odin is the high mind. Billy gave man his walking power. He is your animal power, your crystal they gave man his name and that's your ego, your representation to the world, your carbon. Now, Odin sacrificed himself to himself. He burnt out that carbon body, that they, and sacrificed the they so that way he could become first and third, which is also represented in the stories. He's considered first and third. Because the salt mine and the, the sulfur mine now marry through the sacrifice of the carbon. <clears throat> right. And, you know, I'm noticing more and more these similarities. And I, I expect this because this is something that's come up in every other culture that I've looked into. It's this universality when it comes to these things. And you hear, you know, oh, well, they get these stories from older cultures and they never tell you particularly which one. I think most people assume it's like, oh, well, it's the Babylonians. They were the first people. The Sumerians were the first people. But no, I mean, this is this is far older. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. In fact, you can honestly see in the, the Abrahamic story, they're basically that's a sun that's a sun cult, and they're starting things from a very from a from a halfway point. They don't go back to Ganunga Gap. They don't even recognize that because they're a much newer culture. In right. fact, they even state that their cult our culture was already here. They just don't consider us humans, and so. <laughs> We were already here hanging out, doing our thing, developing things, looking at nature and garnering understandings from it. And they just didn't arrive on the scene till later. And you start looking at other things like in the situation where I just described with the electrical universe, the the sun is is feminine and the moon is masculine. And you look at all these older cultures and the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine. But then when you look at the Abrahamic and their cultures, the sun is masculine and the moon is feminine, which is a very odd thing, which I can a little bit understand because the sun does the projecting at the end, but that's a lack of understanding through the entire cycle. So understanding that the moon did the projecting first, and that's like calling the chicken the masculine one, because the chicken pops out the egg. 
but the the rooster had to fertilize the chicken and then the chicken now produces the fertilized egg so it's a lack of understanding of the process right wow yeah i mean that that's very good to know and that rings true to me honestly that the moon would be masculine and the sun would be feminine i can totally see and this fits into you know someone's research who again like michael wands has been really impactful in the last couple years for me ross ben you know he talks about this inversion or anathema where they sort of create you know an inversion of history and then project you know their alchemical process onto society and create a uh, you know prophecy in this sort of way like program prophecy i mean you see it with the word slav being used and converted into the term slave i mean have you looked into this you are you're aware of this right Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That was, they, they consider that where slavery derived from and and people don't even realize that thinking that slavery supposedly derived from Africa. If you ask the average person without realizing that the word comes from Slav. Right. Right. (laughs) And it it goes back to that alchemical process. You bet. Well, even like, uh, Crow, like Crow talks about you, look at 9-11 where they have the pictures of the people falling out and it looks just like the tower on the tarot cards and the tower is when you're breaking down the prima materia and so the them two people that are always falling out of the tower and the tarot cards the one's always got his legs in the symbol again of the upside down four or the sulfur upside down sulfur symbol so what we have is is the mercury and the sulfur getting pulled out of the body of the plant and the breakdown of the body of the plant itself. And we can understand that when we were looking at 9-11, um, we understand that they were doing an alchemical equation. They're going to break down the old because you can't ever plant something new, even in just basic nature. Throughout the year, if I go out in a cornfield, I plant corn, my corn grows up, and I harvest what I want out of that corn. So they've harvested what they want. Well, then now you need to do the destruction and you need to break down the old so I can plant some new and have the new rise up. Well, they, they need to destroy all the old. So we see the destruction of the old and we see the implementation of everything that they've done from it. And then the thing that they're going to replace is, is the one unity tower you know, which when you're talking about alchemy, you break it down, you break down the two polarized sides or the twin towers or the two things, and you alchemically marry them into one. So we see this entire mind process where they're just leading the country through a process so they can get what they want. Because that's what I do when I do alchemy. I, I want a certain result. So I put it through the process and and put in the component pieces that I want to make that result. They're just using the same process to make this country and this entire world at this point, as we can see through the COVID and the way that basically worldwide they've, you know, gotten the entire world to march in line. And the couple countries that the couple presidents that really balked hard at it, they just disappeared or died. So the entire world's starting to march to that beat and we're really just seeing an alignment and that alignment comes through all through the alchemical marriage. Like I was talking about when I was, when you work with plants, you need to get that alignment and that's what they're doing. Everything's getting in a nice alignment for them. Wow. Yeah, man. I definitely, I'm in the position of like knowledge is power at this point and I have a lot of optimism and a lot of hope but you know given what you know about alchemy and and how it's played out in the larger world stage so to speak you know is there more to what's going on today that you see I mean obviously we've had shows about COVID we've broken that down a lot I'm not asking you to get too far into that but you know given the alchemical symbolism behind 9-11 what do you think about world events today from that lens honestly I think that 
as this battery system, we are winding down. We're coming to a deplete end, end of the cycle where things are getting. And I think that this, while the scarcity doesn't exist now, I think it's coming. And I think we're getting ready to get to a restart. So when Odin was getting ready for Ragnarok, and this is one of the most interesting things, Odin was prophesied Ragnarok. He knew that it was coming. He knew that he was going to die at Ragnarok. And there wasn't anything that he could do to change that. That day he was going to die, no matter what. But he gets to change, he gets to control and choose the circumstances of what's going on around that death. So how is he going to die? And Odin decided that while he's going to die that day, these forces that are tearing apart the world, that are destroying what he built, they die today too. It doesn't matter what else happens, they die today. And that's, that's what we're talking about is, is setting the tone for the next cycle. They, these guys play an extreme long game. And that's the game that is entirely different and why we can't really, most people can't fathom the things that they do and how they've done it. Because they've been playing this game for thousands of years and you're playing the game for 60 years, 80 years at best. And during that 60 to 80 years, most likely you're going to run on a hamster wheel for all you're worth until you have a couple of years where you go in and out of hospitals and go fishing a bit until you die. And <laughs> you don't get to figure out anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, given that, I mean, what does Odinism offer you as an individual that gives you hope? Because I know, you know, being on a farm, being self-sufficient, I I assume, I don't want to assume too much, but being self-sufficient, obviously those things can help you avoid the common stress that most people afford being so attached to the matrix or society. I myself, you know, I'm very hopeful and well, moving towards that, we'll say. In the future, I definitely want to be in the same position or a similar position as you where I you know, have a farm and, and I am self-sufficient. But you know, what are your solutions given that knowledge? You know, Obviously, going off the grid is, is something that our buddy Steve has been talking about a lot lately. I know he did these off-the-grid builds. Were you his friend that was, was a part of that? I, don't, I didn't get all the details on yep. that. Yeah. You bet. You bet. Right on. You bet. Probably what, at least one of them. <laughs> I don't know how many he's done, but yeah, without a doubt. And, and, and I think you're, you're without a choice. We're going to start seeing, we're already seeing that they're controlling and cutting back the supply chains of things. And if people want to have things and want to have a steady supply of the things that they need, by necessity at this point, they're going to start having to shorten their supply chains and finding things from a more local source. And that's going to, that's going to take away a lot of the control right out the gate, right Right out the gate. Because when you, part of the reason that the Roman, the Roman Christian empire had to destroy the heathen cause people and the people like it and the native Americans and things like that is we aren't civilized. There's a difference between a self-sufficient man and a civilized man. A a civilized man knows how to follow rules in society and society is going to provide a lot of things for him. And he's going to behave as society tells him to behave because he's civilized and he needs to do that or else society will no longer provide for him the things that society says that they're are going to provide because he's not acting in accordance. A a self-sufficient man who has his own food, who has his own water, his own farm. I don't need anything. I act how I want. I do what I want because I don't need those things. Just like in this upcoming example where everybody's concerned about even being able to go into a grocery store if you're not vaccinated if I, if I have all my own food at my own home, why do I care? I don't need to follow your rules. Get bent. 
Right and on. that only comes, you know, and that only comes with that self-sufficiency. Right. If I don't have that self-sufficiency, I still need to eat. So I guess I better get vaxxed in order to go get my food or to go watch the concert I want to go to or whatever the case may be as these things keep building up. And so the absolute answer to that is self-sufficiency. As much as you can be self-sufficient and be not just self-sufficient, but start, and this is something you're starting to see a lot of. Like Steve has a bunch of friends that do these freedom cells and I have a friend, Owen Benjamin, he's got the bear, the great bear trail. And these are just cells of people who are living off homesteading, making their own things by hand and producing. And these people are starting to get together and come together in a counter society where you're not trying to make laws for each other and control each other. But hey, George, you got some eggs because I got some milk and we can trade my milk for your eggs because I like eggs and you like milk. And this doesn't include having, you know, and we don't need to make laws for each other. We don't need to control each other. We just need to not be dicks to each other so we can trade milk and eggs. And then if there's a road between us that we need to travel in order to do that trade, well, we both had probably better chip in a little bit to keep in that road righteous so that way we can continue doing what we want to do on that road and that's the thing people don't understand about this self-sufficient because we're mostly anarchists even to our gods and odinists we don't get down on our knees and pray we don't ask our gods to do anything i don't ask odin to come do me favors when i talk to odin i i either ask him to help me understand something or i ask odin to come watch Look at me, dude. I'm about to make you proud. I'm about to whoop some ass, man. And you're really going to like this. You're going to be glad I'm one of your dudes. And I don't come begging to him. And that's, that's something that is entirely built into our lifestyle. So we're really anarchists by, by nature. And the thing people don't want to understand about an anarchist is this isn't an 80s punk. I'm pissing all over the salad bar, destroying everybody's stuff. Because as an anarchist, like these freedom cells and like this bear trail, I'm going to want to deal with these other people. And if I go over wrecking your stuff, you're not going to want to give me eggs. You're not going to want to be my friend. You're probably going to pull out a gun when I get to the edge of your property and you see me. That's not going to work out at all. What an anarchist is, is somebody that lives self-sufficient by their own rules. That doesn't mean that I'm not subject to the world around me. I still got to answer to the world around me. So when my neighbor over here is stuck, I go over and I see her stuck. I run over and go over and give her a hand and get her unstuck. And if I get stuck or something happens to me, my neighbor comes over and helps me because we become somewhat responsible for each other in our own self-independence. And, and we just aren't made to by a governing authority who decides what morality is good and what we need to do and tells us by force. And then we don't even get our own force because if we want to use force, that's a problem. Only they get to use force. Wow. That's beautiful, man. And thank you for leading that example because that's so inspiring to someone like me, you know, I'm coming up on my 27th birthday here, you know, becoming a man and, really trying to figure out, yeah, where am I going to go? What what am I going to do as far as property in this changing world? And, and I definitely need to find some piece of land somewhere, but Odinism has become my new favorite interest, man. This is so fascinating. I, I feel like there's way too much to cover in so little time. So I got to invite you to come back on soon, man. This has been, cause we didn't even touch on the, the tree of life and the, and the well, connection that's one of my cannabis. favorite subjects. Yeah. Let's, let's get into that a little bit before I let you go. Cause we are coming close to an hour and a half, so I don't want to keep you too long, but if you would give us a, uh, a breakdown on, on your understanding of how cannabis connects to the tree of life. Oh, wow. Cause cannabis, because you can break down these three levels of oil and you so understand them when you look at the tree of life. And now when I speak of the tree of life, I have a different tree of life than what most people look at. 
in my opinion, the Abrahamics have, they have a, what I would call a broken tree of life. And so it's incomplete and it, it, it shows in every way that they do everything, the way that they look at everything. And I'm not talking about specifically the Christians, because I think Jesus came along and tried to rectify a lot of this, but the, the Abrahamics turned around and bit it, bit it right back in. So when you're looking at the tree of life, when, I, and this is something that Odin gifted me, we even have a tree of life that's truncated like that. And that tree of life represents one mind. And so it's actually three interlocked trees, just like when you're talking about alchemy on a plant with the three things, it's always those three. And so it's two trees that are locked with another tree that sits over top the two and locks them together. It's, it's just a beautiful process. Now, when we're looking at this, and especially with cannabis, it's so nice. We understand that the top tree, the high tree, is your oil tree. And this is going to have your three levels of oil, or your terpenes, your CBD, and your THC. Now, one of the most interesting things about the tree of life and about cannabis is we understand with this is, is that that top level of oil or that third eye, that high mind, that is locked up. And that's a problem. And we understand that with cannabis really easily because you can't just go pick cannabis off of the plant and eat it and get the psychoactive effects. What needs to happen is it needs to be decarbolated. So what's going to happen is you have a, a THC molecule and there's a carbon attached to this, C, to this THC molecule. Now, through the process of heat it's going to degenerate and this carbon, which is more unstable than the rest of this, it's going to unattach and it's going to leave. And now this molecule that was stable is slightly unstable and it's able to grab onto things. What we're talking about cannabinoid receptors and we're talking about the salt that it needs to go open up. So this high mind this THC mind needs to go down and bite the lowest salt, which is where you get your Ouroboros, or in my, in my cosmology, it's Jormungandr, is the snakehead biting the tail. And when the snakehead bites the tail, this, it comes across, and now this oil, this high oil, opens up this low salt. And when you look at the tree of life, when this happens, and you look at that representation, that's what you can see there is the star of David, the this, this six-pointed star where the two ends cross. And when you look at the story of like Solomon, that's the seal of Solomon. Solomon didn't just have a legion of angels, which is what would make sense if angels were the end-all, beat-all. If they had all, all the power and all the knowledge and God was totally behind them and everything, why did he need legions of angels and demons? What do you even need the demons around for just to do dick shit? Like, what do you got <laughs> yeah. these guys here for? Yeah. I, I don't even understand. So what it was is the angels represent the salt or the oil side and the demons represent the salt side. Wow. And when you take the upside down triangle and the right side up triangle and the two cross each other, that's where the snakehead bites the tail. And that's the THC going down and opening up that lowest salt. That's Odin throwing his eye down the well and opening up both sides. So you have open access to both sides and then marrying them together. And with cannabis, it's such an easy process to understand and see. And you can break down the plant. Again, like I said, most everybody knows that THC breaks down into different components of THC. And each one of those does slightly different things. So you can see that high oil breaks down into four other component pieces, which you would consider then your fire fraction, your air fraction, your water fraction, and your earth fraction. And each of those, even though it's the same thing, is slightly different than the same thing. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, like the fire fraction is a chaotic version of the same thing that the earth fraction is, which is a stable coagulated version of the exact same thing. 
you know? So it's, it's just, it's such a fine state. You're, you're basically looking at like water, water is the same thing, whether it's ice and it's in its frozen state or whether it's in its water state or whether it's in its vaporous state as just gas in the air. This is all just the same thing, but it's, it's not quite the same, right? It, it, it's different. And so this is what we're, you were kind of talking about a similar thing with the, with this, the most chaotic of the THCs is going to do a certain thing and have slightly different reactions than the, the last one that fractions off. So it's real nice to see that and tie that. And when you look at then at the tree of life, what you have then is the three levels and each of those three levels separate into four. So you have 12 and then the 12 levels of salt and they tie together over the earth. And again, this is why like Jesus, you know, again, this is, there are solar worshipers, so he has his 12 apostles and all that. So all these, all these numbers start making sense. And then when you look at the tree of life, not just the Star of David or the Solomon Seal, you start being able to look at so many different symbologies. If you've never watched that video on my YouTube, it's fantastic. But you start seeing all these different symbologies inside the tree and then you can start looking at what those symbologies are going to mean by the way they're placed in the tree. Is it, uh, is it above the carbon line or below the carbon line? So is it going to be on the fire side or is it, you know, the sulfur side or is it going to be on the crystal side? Is it going to be on the right side or the left side? Cause the one side's more feminine and the one side is more masculine. So is it above the fire line and is it on the right side? then that's going to be one thing. Is it above the carbon line and on the left side? That's going to be another thing. So it just starts really refining things and breaking it down. So you start really gaining an understanding of symbology of the way the plant itself breaks down. It's fantastic. Fantastic. I I couldn't agree with Bennett more. I also love Michael Wan that you keep bringing mentioning michael's fantastic also i love that guy well and maybe we can touch on that a little bit because i did just start a new podcast with michael Wan. him and i are co-hosting it's called your handbook for the apocalypse and i'm definitely going to send this interview his way because i'm sure he'll be fascinated and i'm wondering you know given you know about michael's work if you have anything more to say about the connection between these cultures and the Northeast, because I myself has have visited a location called Gungi Womp. It's in Connecticut near the Groton submarine base to bring them into the fold. But it's it's in Connecticut and it's allegedly built by Celtic travelers. That's the real story that, you know, you can hear. And then other people say, no, this was built by, you know, an indigenous culture a long, long time ago. And then there's, you know, the Kensington rune stone. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about that, but is there anything more you've learned in that realm? Is that something you're interested in? That, that is absolutely fascinating. And my, obviously Michael knows infinitely more than I ever would, but I do find that some of the name similarities and some things fascinating. And then also just the way that our societies conducted themselves. So he draws these parallels uh, between the two areas and we look now, what we've got to do is remove out the Roman Catholic society. So the, that the way the Roman Catholic society acts, and that's coming out of the Mediterranean, whether you're talking about the Abrahamics coming out of uh, Israel, Palestinian region, or whether you're talking about the Romans, we're talking about this little Mediterranean area. So before they entered the picture, the way the Celtics, the Gauls, the, the uh, Teutons, the Germanics, the way these people lived was extremely tribally. And again, these people, they had a, feminine sun, a masculine moon. They were a very honorable people. They were considered barbarians. And another funny thing is not only were we not considered human, but until they conquered those areas, they were not even considered part of the world. Like when you read those old, like even Greek stories and they're like, yeah, the whole world. But then we went over to this other area where there were some pagans and other dudes and we just started wrecking their crap. 
that wasn't apparently part of the world, you know? So it's, it's, it's very interesting how, how the, how very narcissistic the, the Roman Catholic society is right. and self-centered. So, uh, but minus them, like I said, you start looking and you start seeing all these extreme similarities between the two societies. And, and you, you start understanding like with natives, you don't see as much twisting because we actually are so much closer to that society, you know, where they were conquered within the last couple hundred years where the Northern European society was conquered a thousand years ago. And so we've forgotten so many of those things, but we understand like another funny thing for as much as they talk about Northern Europeans being a bunch of drunks and these drinking barbarians, we drank mead, which is a low alcohol fermentation. And with that low alcohol fermentation, now let's put a logical mind to things. We were talking a thousand years ago, so you had no refrigeration. And so your fruits and vegetables that you grew in a very truncated growing system, just like up north in South Dakota and in Canada, where you have an extremely short grow season, the storage is going to become very, very important. And when you ferment a fruit or a vegetable, now it's not going to go bad. It'll, you can store it for years. Right. And it's still got all of its nutritional value. In fact, through fermentation, you've actually brought out more nutritional value. And so you've basically got dinner in a bottle. Well, after uh, the initial meetups between Rome and the Germanic people, it's fairly well known that their first meetup, Rome got smeared like they've never been smeared before. Three Roman legions and all their followers killed to a man. The, the Germanics had no mercy for him. Well, then they flooded that entire area with Roman wine. And just like when we talk about the stories about the natives being getting drunk and not being able to fight anymore, the same thing happened to the Northern Europeans. They all started drinking Roman wine and that, you know, vaunted ferocity and prowess just kind of disappeared in a drunk fog and uh, hangovers. We've just had a thousand years now to process it. We do a lot better with drinking than they, you know, where the Native Americans haven't been getting that hardcore alcohol, but, you know, much shorter times, they don't process it as well. But we start looking at the way they live tribally. We understand that we start finding, like you said, the Kensington runestone, all these other things. You start looking at some of the stories coming out of these tribes where they talk about having white skin and red-haired ancestors, things like that. This tells you that the Northern European people openly traded and openly visited these cultures and and got along with them. It's not until the the Abrahamic cultures with the Spanish Inquisition came along. Now we're we're looking at uh, a bunch of destruction and, you know, perversion and all the different things that come with that where they have to convert. And the funny thing that I really get a kick out of is people don't even realize that the Dark Ages was the Northern European conversion, where everybody talks about, you know, Abrahamic things like that's a white, you know, religion. The Dark Ages was white people, the Northern European, whitest of the white, getting converted to Abraham. You know, the, the, you look at Ireland where you've got, St. Patrick, and he drove all the snakes off of an island, an island that snakes have never existed on. That was the pagan worshipers from that island. And right. anybody that wouldn't convert to Christianity was either tortured to death or had to leave the island. Well, that happened to the entire Northern Europe. That was the Dark Ages where we were all getting crucified, killed, yeah, turned into Christians. And it's just happened so long ago that now we don't even remember our own culture and the beauty of it. And that's part of why I think so many uh, white people with the Northern European heritage are really drawn to Native American culture because they live like we did. That's what their culture was, was our type of culture. We got along with those people fine. And now we've been turned into this uh, 
a civilized culture that's ran by Babylon and ran by the uh, Abrahamics. And that culture is the only one. It's funny, most stories cross pretty much every cosmology. No matter which cosmology you look at, if you start looking at the mechanics of the stories, they all start matching up. And the same events kind of happen in everybody's cosmology. The Tower of Babel, that only happens in the Abrahamic cosmology, that Babylonian cosmology. Where? <laughs> Thanks, lick a tongue. I got a puppy licking my headset here. <laughs> um, that only happens in the Abrahamic, where this entire society all gathers into one giant city and all becomes one giant civilization and all start speaking one language and having one law and one God that only happens in their cosmology in no other, in no other culture. Do, do you see that? And this is where you end up because this is where you end up with this fight. And it's funny because most people, they think that there's multiple monotheistic cosmologies and obviously multiple cosmologies that worship multiple gods also, but they don't realize of the monotheistic cosmologies, they're all Abrahamic. If it, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, it doesn't matter if you're uh, right. Muslim or Christian, that's the same God. It's all derived from the same set. Exactly. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, they don't even. Un- yeah. So that's one system and all the other systems are polytheistic where we have like in my personal co- in in heathen cosmology, I follow Odin, and Odin's going to be a, a Mercury type god. He's a Mercury being. Mm. Odin took the high and the low, and he put them together. Now, there's also people that worship the Asir. So, and then of the Asir, which is an entire pantheon of gods, you have like Tyr, Tyr's the god of honor and courage. And so if these are things that are really important to you and acting in that type of way, you know, acting with, you know, honor and things like that, that's going to be the God that you're most drawn to and you're going to find patronage there. And that's okay. That's a good thing. We need people that act like that. And, and possibly you're going to maybe like Loki the best. And you're going to be a more chaotic person that just does whatever happens in the situation. And you're also going to be the one that doesn't have the rigid thinking. You're going to have, you know, the most out of line ideas and the most interesting ideas. So we need that dude too. And you're obviously not going to be drawn to Thor, who's very rigid and Thor goes out and Thor, he smashes ice giants. And that's what Thor does. And then I went home and I drank and then I went up. And I smashed some ice giants and I ate. And that's what Thor does. He <laughs> smashes ice giants and he eats. Maybe you, maybe that is not your thing. You know, it's a very honorable thing. And he's the one who protects society. He's the one who keeps everybody safe and everything in order and in line. But maybe you don't like that so much. And so you're not drawn to him. And that's fine. And with each one of these gods, they all have their own stories, which makes them extraordinarily relatable and makes you understand the aspects that that God is representing and the things that they are. So it it, it makes it a lot easier to understand things and a lot easier to be drawn to certain things instead of just this one overarching thing that says, hey, I'm uh, all the good side and anything else is the bad side. Yeah, like I'm the one and only God. Every other God is a poser. It's basically like how their rules start. <laughs> right, right. Which doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other gods. They just suck. Yeah, like, yeah. Don't listen to them. <laughs> I'm the cool one. <laughs> right, right. You know, so it, it, it's it's just a very interesting thing and and honestly like i said then when you start and you really look at it when you look at the angels and the demons and you look at how much is put into angels and that angels provided the entire old testament the old testament because uh god angels it's hilarious because angels can't be trusted and yet angels have to be the link because you can't talk to god yourself because that would like blow your mind up 
So you need to hear it from an angel. And the angels, it says right in their book, are liars with their own agenda. And then the entire Old Testament is orated to Moses by an angel. Wow. Now, this is bringing to mind something that I was talking about with Michael Wan today. And I'm not sure if it was on the actual podcast or off the air, but we were talking about elementals and possibly how these beings could be, you know, destructive or negative towards people and it gets misinterpreted as demons. I'm wondering where maybe angels fit into that and where elementals fit into this stuff. Cause I, I think most people would agree, not that I'm going to go and believe in the environmentalist bullshit, but the planet is hurting. We can all see that we're polluting and the corporations that are telling us it's carbon, carbon dioxide are just trying to, you know, fake it. But that whole conversation aside, you know, obviously the planet is not in uh, alignment with our society. So I tend to think, you know, elementals are just like doing their own thing and then we come and fuck up their shit, you know, to use plain terms. Right. And then they, you know, unleash their wrath on us and then we're like, oh no, there's ghosts, there's demons. there's So does that, I mean, does that ring true with you? And, and if not, like what is Odinism, how do they consider elementals? So, so what we would consider an elemental would be like a Jotun. Now, when you look at, let, let's break this back down into alchemy. When you look at the Asir, the Asir in that pantheon is going to be like sulfur beings. So these are going to be oil, you know, your oil side. They're going to be high, vibrating higher and faster than you. Now, elementals are going to be like the Jotun. They're going to come from the cold side. They're going to be, again, more like a crystal where it's going to be more dense, more pure, and vibrate on that lower level, that real low, even vibration, you know, more earth-like where the, like right. the planet only vibrates to at the what tree is of like life. Eight. Right, right, exactly. So mm. we live on the carbon plane. And elementals are, are beneath us, vibrating beneath us. That's the more like the earth and crystal vibration. And the, the, the angels and your Asir, whatever you want to call them, are going to be on your oil, your sulfur vibration. They're going to be vibrating fast and high. And even when you look at the story, the story is angels are up, up in heaven, up above us. And then some angels go and fall and become demons. So if, if air becomes hot, it rises and then air becomes cold, that air automatically falls and becomes more dense and gains more body and becomes more thick. Right? So that's all we're looking at when we're talking about that is a fall or a cold, it becoming more dense and more thick. So we're talking about with that story, the polarization of a bee. And so we split into a fire side and an ice side and the fire side's like, yeah, our side's great. And the ice side's like, yeah, you guys are losers. <laughs> and <laughs> right. And so what we're supposed to get out of this story, cause this is what Odin was. Odin was the mercury being in between. And Odin was like both fires. I need both fire and ice. And so we're supposed to be the being in between these two things. We're supposed to respect the elementals, the land whites, whatever the demons, whatever we call them, because they're going to have that earth power, that that material power. That's like the parts house. And then your your angels or your seer or whatever you want to call those more etheric beings. That's going to be where your higher thinking comes from. So you're not going. So that's not going to be your parts house. That's going to be more like your engineer. And what you're supposed to be is the contractor, the guy in between the, the engineer and the parts house. That's like, okay, engineer, dude, we can't really get those parts, but this is what we can get. Whip us up this. He draws up his plans and you take him to the parts house. Like, all right, I need these parts. And you're the one that's going to materialize it on the, this plane on the carbon plane. That's the mercury being you were born a mercury being just like Odin, just like Jesus, just like Mithras, just like Hermes Trismegistus, Trismegistus, three minds, not one, three. You were born with 
three mines. You have a salt mine. You have an oil mine and you have a mercury mine. And you're supposed to be going through the great work yourself of opening up that high mine, opening up the, that salt wisdom, and then merging them together in the middle. You're supposed to be that dude. Brilliant. I love it. It rings so true with a lot of the books that I really think are pivotal to my understanding. I mean, not that they were directly about Odinism either. I mean, he's definitely mentioned, but I love it. And I think, you know, it harkens back to this, you know, higher universalism that I always kind of point to. But I think, you know, what we're really getting down to here is like a root that goes further back than any other source of this type of information. And I think that it's not only true to who I am ancestrally, but also in this sort of landscape sort of way, you know, all the connections to this land where I was born and the ancestors that are here, I think honoring them and their culture yes. is so important, you know, and, and bravo to you for doing that. Benjamin, I encourage people to go to heathenwizard.com and Odin's Alchemy on Rockfin and get in touch with you and, and check out all the awesome things you're doing out there in the wild. I mean, wow, definitely this is going to be a reoccurring guest here, folks. I mean, I'm totally, I'm definitely sold on Odinism. I need to find a book. Is there any, for people who are like me, like right now, and they're as psyched as I am, is there any books you recommend or sources uh, besides, of course, your work where people can go to learn more about this stuff? Absolutely. The uh, Havamal is the, first book and that's it's the words of the high one there it's the words of odin and that's where i fell in love with odinism i literally had studied just about every other cosmology you could possibly imagine and found beauty and truth in in all of them but when i read the havamal it was like putting on an old glove it was like oh this is mine <laughs> this wow. is this is where i belong and then from the Havamal, you end up moving on to the, the saga or the Eddas, the poetic Edda and the uh, prose Edda. The prose Edda is really kind of a companion to the poetic Edda because anytime you're talking about one of these older cosmologies, especially the ones that were passed on orally, one of the ways that it was ab you were able to keep it and verify its uh, fidelity was through the poetic meter. And so understanding that if I change a word, you know, now it's not going to necessarily fit into the poem. And so any of these old oral traditions are typically passed uh, poetically. And so the prose edda helps you understand the usage of poetic terms, you know, like when you're talking poetically, like one of the examples would be Freya's Tears, uh, Freya's tears, then that means gold. It doesn't actually mean a teardrop from Freya. It means gold, things like that. So you understand some of the things that they did with the poetic license. And that's going to get your older, the more mythology type pieces of it taken care of. And then you move on to the, the more saga type pieces, which are typically more considered just a straight history. And a lot of them will actually have historical, even in today's school system, historical value where they consider them historical, such as the Vinland saga, which is the discovery of North America. Some of them are a little, a little bit more fanciful, like the Nibelungs and things like that have more fanciful stories. That would be a fun one to go through where we talk about the cycles and how it matches up the cycles and also how it ties to the Lord of the Rings, because then the Nibelungs ties that, where you start seeing the, the return of the king. Well, it always starts out with the, uh, the reforging of the sword, because winter is always the high feminine, where the masculine's broken, and it's nothing but feminine. And then you get the reforging of the sword, and that's spring, where you have a feminine-masculine mix, and then summer is return of the king and so on and so forth. And then with fall, the feminine comes back in and you get the fruit. And then, so the whole thing ends up breaking down into a cycle. It's real beautiful, but that's going to be your sagas, like the Nibelungs 
And one of the fascinating things about the sagas and our stories are not all the stories is the hero or the main character of the story, particularly a hero. Like some of the sagas, like Eggle's saga, you're reading it and you're like, God, Eggle was kind of a douchebag. Like, why are you even writing about this guy? So you see in some of these sagas, some of them, the, the main character might not even be somebody who's portrayed as like this good guy or this hero. So I find a whole lot more realism in our sagas and in our keepings. You know, everybody knows, not everybody's a nice guy. Superman's not realistic, you know, like, uh, you know, you walk up to somebody that's, that's trying to destroy the world and kill all of humanity. You're not, you don't just go up, I'm the good guy. Let me grab you by the nape of the neck and drop you in prison. That, that no realism to that. None, you know? So I, I find ours to have a lot more realism. It's a lot more, more identifiable. And maybe that's just because I am a he and I am Germanic. So that's, it's, it's in my blood. So maybe that's why, you know, and other people find other things more identifiable. Yeah, no, right on, man. And like I told you off the air, I am too Germanic, at least my last name, uh, Steve's. It's an Americanized version of the German name Steve. And there's some history there. But like I said, man, we're wrapping up. So one more time, tell folks where they can find you. And uh, again, dude, love to have you back on the show because I feel like there's so much more to get into, especially after I dive into those books you just recommended. I, I definitely need to search those down. But yeah, go ahead and, and, and tell the people where they can find you. And I, I would love to be back on, brother. This was a gas mark, and it was an honor to be here. And it's Benjamin Balderson on Rock. And then on YouTube, and then also Owens Alchemy is the actual name of the show. And then the theheathenwizards.com is my website. And I have a few, I got some jewelry that I make and a uh, few other things like that. And then Benjamin Balderson on Facebook, YouTube, or, or uh, Facebook, Instagram, or uh, Twitter. That's the other thing. Twitter. <laughs> I, I'm just, I just got a computer from my son a few months ago and really started getting the production put up for, I, I built my own farm. I can wire the entire house off grid, put in the plumbing. And then I touch a computer. I'm like, what's this box thingy? <laughs> Dirt. <laughs> Well, I definitely am glad you finally are on the airwaves in this way because, dude, I'm eager to learn more, and I'm sure there's so much more you have to teach, especially in the off-grid side of things. I mean, that not so much at this point in my life, but it's definitely going to become more and more important once I get my own property. But, dude, again, thank you so much for joining us on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. And I'm about to show you this because you mentioned that you make jewelry. I'm going to turn the camera on. I had it off. Because I didn't want you to think I was distracted, but I just do this sometimes to keep myself occupied while I'm listening. I wire wrap this crystal uh, little pendant that I'm not finished with, but I just think that's a dope synchronicity that you make jewelry, and I was making jewelry fantastic. during this conversation. <laughs> so, and that's moonstone that is, that's and sunstone. Hilarious. So we're putting the alchemy into it too. Oh, fantastic. That That is hilarious because most of the jewelry is wire wraps. Right that, on. That is fantastic. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I mean, right there, folks, is a great place to end it. Thank you so much for listening to the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast, and you'll hear more from me soon. All right. Thank you for tuning in to this awesome episode of my family thinks I'm crazy. It's a podcast. We're also on YouTube. We're also on Rockfin. We're also on Instagram. We also have a new Telegram. Sign up on Telegram. T dot me. I think that's what it is. That's what the link is. Hold on, folks. I just put it on Instagram. Uh, it is T dot me slash my family thinks I'm crazy. That's right, folks. Sign up on Telegram and join the conversation we got a lot going on, and if you really want to join the family, come on over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash MFTIC. I release the episodes early, and uh, yeah, we got the scene. If you want to see behind the scenes, the synchromystic exploration of the ever-expanding now, be sure to go over to the Patreon. I know if you've been listening to the episode all the way through, 
you're someone who I might like to talk to. So come on over there. We've got 26 or 7 folks. And yeah, we got some cool conversations going. And I think we're going to have more to come with this new Telegram. So please, even if you don't sign up on the Patreon, go over to the Telegram and join in. Let me know what your favorite episode is. Let me know what you'd like to see talked about on the show. Maybe there's somebody who you think would be a great guest on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast. That's the place to get in touch, as well as the Instagram. Instagram, My Family Thinks I'm Crazy on Instagram. All right, folks, thank you for listening and have a great moment wherever you are in the now. Peace.